Hi, this is Misha, and I really hope you like Mosins. When we first started doing the table talks a couple of years ago, the first video we did was on Finnish Mosin Nagants. And I've been waiting to kind of revisit, as we've been revisiting with this microphone, the new camera, the new software, the new hopefully better resolution and format, everything, until I could show you a good array of Finn Mosins. What was originally going to be a one, maybe two part series is probably going to end up being four. <laughs> and it's mostly Mosins. <laughs> so again, I hope you enjoy Mosins in detail. I do. So, for episode one, we're going to talk about the early Finn Mosins from Independence through the mid-1920s. On the table, we have a standard Russian 1891 infantry rifle. This has the very long barrel. We're at about 51 and a half inches total with a barrel at 31. This was standard in World War I. And Finland used a lot of these just as you see it, without really modifying them much of anything. On the other hand, we have the M24 or M91 slash 24. It's written both ways. This is one of the first major attempts to improve the Mosin for Finnish use. Notice the stepped barrel here. And this was not an army rifle, this was a civil guard rifle. And then finally for the first part, we have the Finnish M91, which was their designation for the Mosin. And this is one of the most heavily modified examples with the new stock, new sling swivels, and several upgraded internal parts. And this one's actually from World War II, but it'll work today for our purposes. Alrighty. A really brief look into Finnish history. In December of 1917, Finland declared independence from Russia. It had been under Russian occupation for over a hundred years. Or if you want to be more kind, it had been a Russian protectorate for over a hundred years. Either way, words. You don't just declare independence even with all the turmoil in Russia at the time. It had to fight. And it did so until about May of 1918, finally earning its independence. As such, it established its own military. There were two major branches. You had the army, and you had the civil guard, which was equivalent to the national guard, but more independent. Although the command structures were intermingled at the higher levels, they had their own procurements, their own equipment, so on and so forth. There was also the fledgling Finnish Navy, and eventually, of course, they would have their own Air Force. But in the beginning, it was the Army and the Civil Guard that really were important. Also important, these guns. Finland found itself with a bunch of Mosins, mostly the infantry rifle, a few Cossacks and Dragoons, but mostly the infantry. Now, for history on the Mosin itself, we've got a multi-part series on Russian Mosins, so I'm not going to talk about that today. I will say that once they took stock, they found they had about 190,000 Mosins in their possession by 1919. You know, most were in good shape, some were beat up, some had bad bores, some were really only worth it as scrap. But they decided to standardize on the Mosin. Now, after their independence, they found that they did have a hodgepodge of all kinds of weapons. 
including a good number of Mausers. And we will talk about a couple of thin use Mausers in part three. But they had a bunch of stuff, but what they would do, they wanted to make the Mosin as their standard rifle, but just because it was logical. And they wanted to make 7.62-54R their standard cartridge, although they had their own specific loading, which was a little different. As time would go on, they would trade guns, such as Mausers, to other nations for more Mosins. After World War I, a lot of European nations, especially Eastern European, had tons of Mosins and weren't really interested in them. So Finland would find a way to either buy them on the cheap or trade for them. And they would start doing this pretty early on and continue well into the 1940s, adding about 175,000 more Mosins to their inventory. Now keep in mind, some of these were in poor shape. Maybe the receivers were good, but the barrels were crap. Or they had a good barreled action, but the stocks were busted. Or the receivers were busted, and they were only good for parts. Other ones, though, were in perfectly fine, usable condition. So the whole gambit. So, you know, you think, oh, they had over, you know, they had 350,000. Yeah, but how many of them were in good, usable shape? And the Finns had very high standards for accuracy, therefore very high standards for bore condition. Nevertheless, they would reissue many, 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 many M1891 Russians as the M91. And if they did not need repair replacement, they would basically just leave them as is. I mean, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And this was very much true early on for both the Army and the Civil Guard. So you would see a number of rifles just like this here in Finnish service all the way through World War II. If they worked, they used them. But what if they didn't work? Well, then they would thin them. The earliest efforts to manufacture Mosin Nagant barrels in Finland were in 1922, but they were not terribly successful. In this project was mostly spearheaded by the army. The Civil Guard, as I said, had its own procurement and equipment. In 1923, they contracted with SIG in Neuhausen, Switzerland, to manufacture 3,000 Mosin Nagant barrels. Now, this first contract would be just standard Mosin barrels, standard profile. So it would give a straight profile to the end. But the following year, they would make a sec separate contract for 5,000 with SIG, and they would enter into talks with a conglomerate of firms in Germany, which we know is something like, I starts with a B, guys, a ball of style or something. Sorry, it's a conglomeration anyway. And there would be a German contract. So total, we would have about 8,000 barrels made in Switzerland, and the German contract would run until about 1927 with about 13,000 barrels. But the engineers at the Swedish, excuse me, the Finnish uh, Civil Guard modified the barrel specs in early 1925. They wanted to go to a heavier hopefully more accurate, more durable barrel. And that's where the stepped barrel comes from. They added about a millimeter in diameter. As you can see this heavier up here. Now the reason it has the step and gets the standard profile here is so the standard bayonet, the spike bayonet, will still work. The second Swiss contract would have the stepped barrels, at least the majority of them. And pretty much all, if not all, of the German barrels would be stepped. From what I know, all of them were, but you never say never. There might be someone who says, oh, the first 500 were straight. Who knows? Okay, so we went to a heavier barrel in early 25. And so the M24 has two variations, straight and stepped barrel, but the stepped barrel is much more common. But because we have a heavier barrel, we have to inlet the stock, basically hogging it out a bit to take it, 
and we have to modify the upper handguard a bit, hogging it out to take the thicker barrel. This would kind of come back later and be very important in later guns. While they were at it, some guns would receive modifications. They still had the original Russian rear sight, the Kalov sight. But they would add a, a final kind of rear position here. They would machine a notch back here for a 150 meter battle sight, as it was called. They would also start to recalibrate these later from arshins to meters, putting meters on the right side and taking the original Russian arshin markings off the left. Sorry, guys, got a hair in my. They would also check out the bolts, kind of smoothing them out as necessary. They would also fin match them if they weren't matching. Now, fin guns, what fin matching basically means, on a Mosin, you have four serials. On the barrel, which is considered part of the receiver usually, on the bolt, on the floor plate of the magazine, and on the top of the butt plate for the stock. And the fins didn't give a rat's ass about the magazine or the stock, so most fin guns will either just have those serials scrubbed off, lined out, whatever, they don't care. The two serials they cared about were on the barrel receiver system and the bolt, and often the bolts would be renumbered. So fin matching means the bolt matches the barrel. That's what they cared about, because that's what worked together. They would also modify the trigger, adding a second spring eventually, and smoothing it out to try to get a better trigger system. Because, as we all know, the Mosin system is not fantastic. And they would also see what they could do to improve the magazine. So they would rework part of the action, but the major difference with the M24 was the new barrel, and thus the modification required to the stock to let it sit in there. And like I said, the German contract would run until about 1927. These would be assembled at the predecessor to the factory we know today as Seiko. It became Seiko in 1927 and was basically originally the arsenal, the factory for the Civil Guard. Later it would also supply the army, of course, but in the beginning, 1925-26, it was for the Civil Guard. It was also relocated around the same time it was renamed. So that was the beginnings of Seiko, and obviously Seiko is an acronym. I'm not even going to try because uh, Finnish makes my speech, my TTS program, completely shat itself. Uh, there are way too many vowels in a row and then way too many consonants in a row and it completely makes a dog's breakfast of it and if it can't do it, I... Sorry guys, as much respect as I have for Finland, I just don't know your language. It's very interesting, unique, but I just don't know it. So this was the first, the M24, really kind of separate designation. With all the changes, the new barrel system, uh, the upgraded trigger and such, these really started to come into use around 1926, and that's when the designation really took hold. And again, it can be either 91, 24, or just 24. I really don't know much of a difference. I've seen them used interchangeably. So that was the Civil Guard. What about the Army? As I said, the earliest efforts to make barrels in Finland were in 1922, but only a few hundred were made. But it didn't take long for them to try to start tooling up at Tika, Tikakovsky, which was a subcontractor. It was a private firm, but it was very much in with the government to make barrels. They also tried a few other systems. They tried relining existing Russian barrels that were shot out. They actually sent a committee to Italy to look at their method, the Salerno method, which Italy used quite successfully on the Vetterli Carcano, the M708715, which was re-chambered from 10.4 millimeter 
to 6.5. It was actually a very good process. The guns themselves had faults, but the lining process was not one of them. So Finland was interested. And actually, they would end up relining a number of Russian barrels, around 12, 13,000, and they would be stamped with a P. But there was a lot of skepticism and even criticism, especially from, you know, Emo Lati about it and other people, designers. I think they just really wanted to make their own barrels, and I can understand the whole relining concept, although it worked out pretty decent. I could see where the skepticism might come from. So they tried that. They also purchased a number of barrels from Belgium, and these will have a B marking. And uh, these will continue to pop up in builds throughout the 20s, 30s, and even into World War II. So there was a contract for Belgian barrels. But really, Tika got up and running and was ready to go in 1925, received its first contract for barrels and produced them namely in 1926, 1927. No 1925 dated barrels have appeared yet. And these early barrels would have kind of the stepped profile of the M24, but not all. The M91, as it became known, would only have the barrel replaced if the original was worn out, and even then, it could still have a straight barrel depending on the source of the barrel. And this one does. This one doesn't have the heavier barrel. But it does have a lot of the later changes. It has the modification to the rear sight. It has the smoothed out bolt. It has the added trigger spring. Charge this one for you guys. Actually, this one has a very good trigger for a Mosin. This one has a later style two-piece stock. We'll get into exactly why, probably in video two. But they went to a spliced stock with a new fore-end, which is thicker for the heavier barrels, and just generally speaking, more durable. Also, a new pattern of upper handguard. The rear could either be a new manufacturer, like this is here, which is also made a little thicker at the wrist, or it could be in a Russian original. A lot of the early M91s used the typical dog collar slots, but especially World War II era guns like this one would have the slots filled in and these wire hangers for a standard one inch finished leather sling, which I think is really neat and a definitely a great idea as an upgrade. And we'll talk more about World War II later, but I will say that after the initial run of refurbishing and upgrading 1891s to the M91 for the Army in 26-27, they were pretty much, production was suspended until World War II, until the Winter War. Then it was started back up again, believe it or not. Between 1940 and 1943, VKT and Tika would make more barrels, actually quite a large number, 45,000 and 32,000 respectively. And the barrels pretty much what they're considering the gun. When you, it, We're going to get into this because really when I say Tika made a gun, I really just mean Tika made a barrel or at most a barrel of action. Most of the assemblies for the Army were done at AV-1, AV-2, and AV-3, which were arms depots. For example, most of these M91s were built, assembled from various parts from different contractors at AV-1 and AV-3. So it's, it's very interesting. Now, Seiko early on would also outsource a lot, but as time would go on, they would do more and more internal and we'll get to that in episode two as well. So keep in mind when we're talking about who built something and you see markings on finished barrels like this, that could really just mean the barrel itself. A lot of times assembly was done outside of the factory. But they're considering the barrel pretty much the firearm. And to be fair, that's not an illogical way to look at it because if you look at the receiver versus the barrel, you know, especially if you're making barrels for accuracy, more goes into it. So these were the early 
Finn Moisens. In their first real, these are the first two attempts to improve them. Now keep in mind, like I said, this is a World War II example, but it gives you the idea where the army was going and the Civil Guard. They were going to heavier, let me get the right one here, guys. Heavier barrels, thicker stocks, trying to work on better sling swivels, definitely better triggers. This one's better than the standard Mosin, but it's not as nice as that 91. It still has that slop to it. Also trying to make the bolt smoother. They would also tinker with the uh, interrupter to keep from double feeds happening, modifying the rear sights. One thing I forgot to mention, when they went to the stepped barrel with these, they had to go to a taller front sight to compensate because now our rear sight's on a slightly higher plane because of the step, so they had to go to about a millimeter taller front sight. This should have just a normal cleaning rod, guys. Those were the first, and that was their efforts to make the guns both more durable and more reliable, and above all, more accurate. Finland cared a whole lot about accuracy, and they cared a whole lot about the Mosin, which made a lot of sense. With Russia being a neighbor, and with as many Mosins, and frankly, ammunition for the Mosins they had, it's no wonder they traded off Mausers and other guns to get as many of these as they could. Even if the other guns they traded off may have been better, they needed to standardize, and I don't blame them. They were quite logical. A lot of other countries took much longer to learn that lesson about the importance of being standard. Some of the countries they, you know, obtained Mosins from. They had some from Germany. They had some from France. Actually traded a large number from Poland and got a very large number from Yugoslavia. Some from Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Albania. You get the idea. It's also interesting that a lot of American-made Mosins from Remington and Westinghouse ended up in Finland. There's speculation, but I don't know that anyone really knows 100% why. I think it's this gun, it may be another one I've got, but has a Westinghouse bolt. You guys can look and see. If not, it's one of my others. But just goes to show you, a lot of Westinghouse and Remington guns will appear in Finland for one reason or the other. Well, like I said, for this series, I hope you like Mosins. <laughs> if you did, please tune in for uh, tune in, in soon, if I can talk, for part two. We're going to get into really some of the first radical upgrades of the late 1920s and 30s. And we'll go on from there and see what we can dig up. If you have any questions, it's a really smooth bolt on this one. Or comments, or just want to talk about your own Mosins. For example, this one here, actually, I found in a guy's garage. It was just hanging in there. It's one of the better condition ones I've run across for this style. But yeah, if you'd like to share your own R Russian Mosin story, oh, excuse me, Finn Mosin stories, it's kind of interesting because a lot of these just get labeled as Russian and pawn shops and just kind of sold off as generic. So you can find some good deals, at least you used to be able to. And of course, if you like the video, please click like and also check out our finished playlist. And if you'd like to help support the channel, we wouldn't, we'd have really appreciate it if you could visit our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.